series actually diving into the book. Of course, we had the introduction to Lamentations, but the actual, the first one where we actually got into the book and started going through the chapter verse by verse. If you remember, chapter 1 has 22 verses. Chapter number 2 also has 22 verses. Uh, if we skip chapter 3, <coughs> excuse me, chapter number 4 has 22 verses, as does chapter number 5. There are five chapters in the book of Lamentations. Chapter number 3 is the only chapter that deviates from that uh, uniformity or from that particular pattern. Chapter number 3, though, has 66 verses. So it has just triple the amount. It has 66 verses, so we can still very clearly see a pattern there. 22, 22, 66, 22, 22. So what I did was I actually broke chapter number 3 into three parts. So first week of chapter number 3, we went through the first 22 verses. This week, we're going to go through the next 22 verses. And then uh, uh, the following week, subsequently, next Wednesday, we're going to go through the last 22 verses and end in verse number 66 of chapter number 3. Now, last week, I, I spilled over a little bit uh, uh, outside of verse number 22, and I went all the way down to, <coughs> excuse me, verse number 26, which is really where the context ended. So, technically, I'm going to do the, uh, technically, we did a little bit more than 22 verses. This week we are as well. I'm going to back up a little bit and we're going to begin in verse number 22 because that's where the context begins. Those paragraph markers can be helpful for you. It's not you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit, of course, but those paragraph markers are just man reading and understanding where the context is. So if you'll notice there in verse number 22, you have a paragraph marker. That's where a new paragraph or a new context, context you know, basically is what's going on there in this particular chapter. Of course, there is continuity, but there is a division there as well. Verse number 22, I'd like to begin reading. We're going to focus on a few different points here in these couple of verses. The Bible says in uh, Lamentations chapter number 3, verse number 22, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. Let's read verse number 23 as well. They are new every morning. Great is <coughs> thy faithfulness. Uh, last week when I preached through this, I focused on... The, the, the man that has now revealed himself and started speaking you know, from his own uh, uh, personal perspective more. Of course, it was the analogy or the allegory of the woman previously, the woman of Jerusalem as the city collectively. But in chapter number 3, the man started kind of being more personal. He started speaking from his, his own perspective as he and I and things along those lines. I focused on how he was going through all of these horrible things, these atrocities as I've referred to them as, and he still even in that type of condition got to verse number 22 and he praised God for his mercy. And the reason why is because we all of course deserve to be punished anyways. Look at verse number 22 and I want you to notice what it's actually saying here. It says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Now, <clears throat> If we are re receiving mercy, if it's of His mercies that we are not consumed, what do we deserve? We deserve to be consumed. That is what the writer or the author is conveying right there. He's saying, we deserve to be consumed. We deserve to be consumed. Mankind does because, of course, we all deserve death. We all deserve hell. We deserve the punishment for our sins. We deserve to be consumed. And it's of His mercies that we are not consumed. And then this is interesting as well. It says this, because His compassions fail not. Now, when it says His compassions fail not, this is kind of an archaic way to use the word fail. What he's saying is it, it didn't run out. Now, if you remember the oil that was in the cruise for the woman in uh, uh, Zarephath is what she's called in the Old Testament. The New Testament, she's called the widow of Sarepta. It says that the oil in the cruise didn't fail. That means that it didn't run out. That's what that means. That's how we would word that today. It didn't deplete or it didn't run out. So it's saying his mercies, they never run out. They're never depleted. They're never gone. That's what it means when it says his compassions fail not. Verse number 23, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. <coughs> what's, what's that saying is, is that he's continually merciful. He doesn't stop being merciful. He doesn't run out of compassion. Now, that's interesting as well, and I didn't focus on this last week, because what he's talking about is the fact that we continue to sin. So he says there, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Why? Because his compassions fail not. 
We may be able to be faithful and good and righteous for a very short period of time in our lives, for however long we can live without sinning, or maybe even if you want to consider a grievous sin, we may be able to go a longer period of time. But the, the, the truth remains that you are going to sin continually. You are going to continually sin, <coughs> excuse me, in your life. Right. You'll sin today, you'll sin in three days, you'll sin in five. And you know, hopefully you're able to go long periods of time, very long periods of time, without sinning you know, in the sense of grievous sins or grievous transgressions. But you will continue to sin. You're going to continue to sin. And that's what he's focusing on here is our continual or perpetual pattern of sin. That's why he mentions that they fail not and that they're new every morning. Saying that when we continue to sin, it's just like how it says in Romans chapter number 5 when it talks about where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We're going to continue to sin, but we can never out -sin God's grace or we can ever, never out -sin God's mercy. Amen. He'll continually be merciful to our sin. He'll continually be merciful or gracious towards our sin. That's why he says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Why? Because His compassions fail not. He's saying they don't run out. What does that imply? That He has to continually extend compassion to you. That means he over and over again, he has to give you compassion. He uses that interchangeably here with mercy. He has to keep giving you mercy. Why? Because you're, you're in need of mercy. Because you have sin. You're continually sinning. And then he says, they are new every morning. Saying you wake up and guess what? There's more mercy. There's more grace. Right? There's more compassion each time and every day. Why? Why is he focusing on this? Because we have a perpetual pattern of sin in our lives. And we will always... This is why it's so foolish and stupid for all these people that talk about, you know, you need to turn from all your sin in order to get to heaven. You just got to stop sinning. That is idiotic. You're a liar if you say that you've just completely stopped sinning. You are a, a liar and a hypocrite. Nobody can turn from all of their sin. There is no man that has ever been able to completely make his heart clean. Doesn't exist. Doesn't happen. No man can turn from all of his sin. I'm thankful that his compassions fail not. Amen. I'm thankful that he's continually merciful to, unto us and he's continually gracious unto us and that they're new every morning and that there's always going to be mercy there for me. You know why? Because I understand what the Bible teaches. I understand what real, how reality is. And I'm a sinner. I can try my best to do the best that I can, but I'm going to continually sin. I, I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, like Paul talked about, how, you know, uh, who shall deliver me, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Right. And he's saying, present tense, O oh, wretched man that I am. He even refers to himself as being carnal. He says, I, present tense, am carnal. Paul, while he's sitting down and the Holy Spirit is riding through him, he's saying, I'm a carnal man. O oh, wretched man that I am, right then, he said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The only thing is, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He goes on to, to, to thank God for Jesus Christ being his propitiation. And that's the reason why, and that's the, the means by which he receives grace and mercy. We're in need of continual grace and mercy. We're going to continually sin as long as we are in this flesh. Look at verse number 23. At the end there it says, Great is thy faithfulness. Now I want to plant an idea in your mind that you never, maybe never thought of. Now, at first glance when you look at this guy's situation and his, his state that he's in, you could, you could probably think to yourself, like, man, it would be hard to, to talk about how faithful God is is in this particular <clears throat> situation or context because he's being, he's being punished, he's, he's having all these horrible atrocities that are taking place in his life. And you could say, well, how, you know, it'd be hard to find God faithful in that kind of situation. But if we really take a step back, it's the exact opposite. If we actually look at God's actions in uh, the book of Lamentation and at that time period, <coughs> excuse me, and what he actually did, we would find him faithful. We would actually see that he is faithful and that he was very faithful in his actions. And the reason why is this. God promised the nation of Israel something. He said he would bless them if they would what? Keep the law, keep the commandments. But he also promised them that if they turned on him and they rebelled against him and disobeyed his commandments and disobeyed his statutes, what did God promise him that he was going to do? Or promise them, just the nation of Israel in general. That he was going to punish them and curse them and he was going to bring particular punishments and 
Like I've said so many times, there's really not a stronger word. Atrocities, where a mother is going to end up eating the fruit of her own womb. They're going to be besieged. They're going to have plagues. They're, you know, their cities are going to be destroyed. They're going to be desolate and solitary. They're, they're going to be fearful. Just all of these different types of things. He says those are going to be the punishments of Israel if they disobey him. So let me ask you a question. When it comes to that covenant, was God faithful or unfaithful? He was very faithful, wasn't he? God was actually faithful because he did exactly what he said he would do. Right. He actually was very faithful. So if we look at what God said that he was going to do, if we kind of remove ourselves from the inherent kind of selfishness, because you know what, if we were all to be honest, we have this biasness towards ourselves. When we get into a bad situation, that's why people automatically assume like that God's bad when they get punished. They want to put the blame on God. And God's doing something wrong when something goes bad in our lives. But actually, if we were to take a step back and we were to look at what's going on here, God is actually being faithful and they're being unfaithful. They were given a covenant and God said, if you break this covenant, this is what I'm going to do. And guess what he did? Exactly to the T. The, even the armies that he, that he described that he would bring, they would be swift as an eagle. Babylon, who brought this punishment and this destruction upon them, is described as being as swift as an eagle. God was faithful to every little aspect. Every li he dotted every I and he crossed every T when it came to the words that he said as far as the punishment that he would bring upon them. He was extremely faithful. So you know that actually should strengthen your faith in the Lord and the right attitude would be understanding, hey, God was very faithful when he said he would do that unto us. Why don't we actually try to keep God's commandments and we know that he'll be faithful on the opposite side of the coin. We know that he would be faithful unto us and he would return unto us the blessings that he promised. That is the proper response that a person should have instead of kind of this selfish attitude of why is this happening to me? I don't deserve this. God, you've forsaken me. Well, maybe he forsook you or maybe in the sense that he's punishing you, it feels like he forsook you because... He told you that he would if you did this. Maybe that's why it's happening unto you. So this proves God's faithfulness. And I believe that that makes sense in the midst of this trial for him to have this kind of uh, 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 resonating moment where God is faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. And then he says this, the Lord is my portion. He's saying like the Lord's my part. That's where he's cast his lot. That's what he's trusting in. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. <coughs> Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that seeketh him. That's a good promise. That God is going to be good to those that wait for him. And he's good to the soul that seeks him. God is going to be good to those that seek him. There's never anybody that's, that sincerely tried to find God. And wanted to know their creator. Wanted to know God that wasn't able to find him. It doesn't exist. God is good unto those and to the soul that seeks Him. The Bible tells you, you know, if you seek Him, you're going to find Him. If you knock, He's going to answer. If you ask for something, He's going to give it unto you as long as it's according unto His will. Why? It makes perfect sense that that would be in this context. Because He's faithful. Because He's somebody that you can depend upon. Look at verse 26. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. What that, that is a, a combination of faith and patience. You know how the Bible talks about in the New Testament, add unto your faith patience, right? Talks about, about how we need to have patience. Be faithful, but we also need to be patient. The word patient means to endure. You need to endure. You need to quietly wait. You need to have patience. That's what it's teaching there. We saw that a lot in the book of Hebrews. Then it says in verse number 27, <clears throat> It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Now there are, there are two lessons in this verse that are being taught. Uh, the context, there's one lesson, but then there's also uh, an example. <coughs> an example that's being cited, that's a lesson. And the example or the... <coughs> Uh, the example or the uh, truth that's being cited in order to be used as an example and the lesson that's taught therein is this. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke and then it says in his youth. Now what's that, what that's talking about is that it's good for a, a child to learn how to work when they're a child. It's good for them to have to bear something, to bear a burden. It's good to do work. Now 
A yoke is, uh, uh, is associated with plowing a field. Farming is very difficult work. Now, I've never done, I haven't done a lot of farming. I, I can't say that I haven't done any because I've done little bits and pieces, but not a lot. But I, I can tell you this for a fact, I know a lot of the things that are entailed with farming. I lived very close to a lot of farms. I lived on uh, farm land. It was, you know, albeit not an uh, operating farm or a functioning farm, but there were a lot of operating farms around me. And I had close family members that had operating farms. And I would go to particularly my cousin's house, Caleb, and he, he had an operating farm, numerous cows, numerous chickens, just all different. They had, they had tons of crops that they grew all the time. So I firsthand witnessed a lot of the work that takes place on a farm. I participated very little but I saw the work that it was and I can tell you just from my own eyewitness that it is very hard work. Farming is extremely hard work as you probably already knew and particularly one of the most difficult tasks and laborious tasks is that of plowing a field where you are where, where you know and right here it's actually being related under the work that the that the uh, uh, that the animal is, is doing. I can't remember the, the name of the animal when they're being used in that manner, uh, but it'd be an ox or things like that. There's a particular name when it's you being used to plow. But <clears throat> what's, what's being, why it's being associated related to that <coughs> is because that's extremely hard work. Can you imagine a yoke? It's like, it's almost like captivity, of course, being put upon your neck and then somebody saying, all right, now drag this massive haro, this utensil that's just meant to just dig the ground up. And I want you to plow this entire field and just walk back and forth and back and forth. Just acres upon acres of land. Does that sound like difficult work or kind of difficult or easy? Extremely difficult work. Very difficult work. That's why he's relating that unto this because he wants to say that it's good for a, for a child or it's good for a boy. It's good for both, you know, a boy and a girl. It's good for children when they're in their youth to learn how to work hard. That's what he's saying. Well, you know why? It's because it builds character. And I'm going to relate that to the context because that's what he's talking about in context right now. It is good for a child to learn how to work while they're a child because it builds character. You know, if you look at children, you know, or let's say teenagers or adults, oftentimes <coughs> those that are, uh, you know, of this generation, especially, uh, uh, let's say, like millennials or what's the generation after millennials that are a little bit older than us? What generation would that be? The baby boomers? Would that be right ahead of us? What's the one right ahead of us? I can't remember what it is. Uh, but uh, you know what they are is uh, uh, oftentimes when you see those the types of people that have that kind of entitled entitlement type attitude where they're, they feel like they're entitled to things they think that they just deserve stuff automatically that, that everything's their right you know you hear people saying that all the time you know uh, you know just uh, health insurance is just my right you don't understand what rights mean and exactly obviously but they think that all these things are their rights this is my right. I'm entitled to this. You should be giving this to me. Do you know what that comes from? Because there's patterns in our lives and situations and things that we experience that develop us into the people that we are when we're adults. That is what is molding you and molding your character into how you are going to look at life, how you are going to behave, how you are going to have, what your philosophy is going to be as far as your outlook on life, what you think, how you think life works. How you think things work in this world are going to be based upon how you grew up when you were a child. How you grew up when you were a kid. That is what it's going to be like. That's how, that's how you're going to be able to tell you know, how someone lived when they were a child. And the, you know, <coughs> specifically the generation that I grew up in, the generation that's, that's really probably the generation that I grew up in and the generation that's younger, not necessarily older. I would say the one that's younger than mine. They have this extreme sense of entitlement. It's like the attitude of everybody gets a trophy. That's a bunch of garbage and a bunch of crap. Right. You know, you don't just get something. You don't just deserve something just for participation. Like there's the participation trophies. You know, I don't know if, if Brother Hall, I don't know if you played sports or anything, or if you uh, did any sort of competition when, uh, when you were a child. But I know that in my generation, that when I played sports, even all the way down to like second, third grade playing basketball, there was no such thing as a participation trophy. You either worked for it and deserved it and earned it. You got like the most valuable player. They give out the hustle reward. Like, 
you're not that good, but man, you hustled real hard at least. They would give out this reward for like trying extremely hard that in this particular area you excelled. They'd give out the reward for like the MIP, which is the most improved player. So last year you came to this camp and you were this good, or last year on this, in this, on this basketball team you were this good. Well, this year you improved the most out of anybody from, the, from last year. The most improved player, the most valuable player, the, you know, the most rebounds, the most assists. They'd be like the best passer in basketball. They would give out all these different rewards to the people that actually deserve them. But you know what? The majority went home with no rewards. The vast majority went home with no rewards. Now, what that should do for you is it should give you an incentive. It should give you an incentive and what that should do for you is it should give you an outlook on life to say that if you want something, it's not just going to be given to you. If you want something, you actually have to earn it. You actually, and the way that you deserve something is if you've earned it. Things are not just given out to you. And let me tell you this, that's not how the real world works. There's real competition when it comes to your job. And you're not just going to be given the best position at your work if you're just like the worst, you know, employee. It's not going to work like that. That's not, that's not how the real world works. The position of, you know, a manager, the position of supervisor, the position of the top tech or whatever type of field that you're in is going to be given to the person that deserves it the most. That's how things work. And when children are young, you know what you need to teach them is that they need to, they need to work hard in order to earn or deserve things. They need to be able to work hard in their lives because that's what's going to, that's what they're going to, they're going to need this character when they get older. And if you just teach children, you know, when they're, when they're younger, that, hey, everything's given you. I'm just going to give everything to you. No, no we need, you know, and, and this is why I think chores are actually a good idea. And that when you have particular chores for children, I think they need to do their chores. And if they don't do them, they get in trouble. But I think that there's a good, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a good... Uh, it's a good plan to have incentives for chores. I'm not in, against having incentives for chores and giving people things, children things, if they earn it. Because it, you know what it does is it helps them build character and it, it, it instills in them the mindset of I have to deserve something, you know, in order to get it. I actually, and the way to deserve it is you earn it. You actually have to do the work. And when a child is, is just given things their whole life without actually working for it, they grow up and they turn into this entitled type of just, just, a, 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 you know, a, just a brat is what they turn into. They have an entitlement attitude where they just think that they just need, they deserve everything. They don't have to work for it. They shouldn't have to do anything. They just deserve it. But when you grow up actually having to work hard, and to get projects done in order to fulfill something, then you understand like there actually has to be work that goes into this to complete this. We actually have to fulfill that in order to get, you know, from point A to point B, I actually have to get work done and complete work in order to do this or fulfill this task. That's what, it, what it's teaching. So in context, I want you to understand this. Why is this being cited? Because he's talking about him as a man having to patiently wait for the Lord. He's talking about having to endure and listen, this is very important, and there being hope at the end. He's saying that I'm going to endure and I'm going to quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. But notice that he has to have character. That's what's important. He's talking about how it, it is, it is uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, necessary for him to have character, for him to have discipline and endurance to patiently wait for the Lord until he comes. And that's going to be his reward. Over and over and over again, the Bible talks about, this is why it's very relevant, the example that I just used. It talks about the coming of the Lord, and there's some things that are going to happen. And what's one of the things that's going to happen to us? What's going to be given to us when the Lord comes back? Rewards. You're rewarded for what? The work you've done. Verse number 26 talks about, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of of the Lord. Wade in the Bible is talking about enduring. Right now he's talking about going through hard times. Talking about going through trouble. What's the type of person that can make it through hard times or tribulations or trials? It's a person that has character. It's a person that has discipline. Children learn discipline when they're a child. They, a, a, a person that has self-discipline when they're older is a, is a child that was disciplined when they were younger. 
That's how someone has self-discipline. You learn that through being disciplined when you're younger. It instills in them and shapes them and molds them and then they have it as a characteristic when they get older or a virtue which is uh, self-discipline. When you teach your children to work and to work hard and that you'll receive rewards if you do good and you only get it if you work hard, it builds in them the sense of character and it also shows them how life is because you're going to have to fight through trials in order to get through them. So he's using the, the principle about why, uh, it being good for a man when he's in his youth to bear the yoke. It's good for children to work. You know, you shouldn't have this attitude where your kids, you know, are just constantly sitting around and you're serving your kids. That's not how it works. You know, when we're at, when, when, when mommy's getting the dinner table ready at our house, Michaela is up right next to her side getting all the cups, getting all the food. You know, mommy is the head chef and Michaela is the, she's not even a chef, she is just the servant under mommy. That's what's going on. She gets all the silverware ready. She gets all the food ready. You know, she's, she's, she's dishing out plates every time when we sit down at the dinner table. Any time that I go out to do any kind of like, you know, manly work or anything at all, the boys are always there with me doing whatever kind of work it is. Every single time. And when they start crying and whining and wanting to go inside, what do I say, Jessica? Not happening. Not happening. You got, you better, and I'll, I tell them, repeat, and I get on them repeatedly about, you know, stop acting whiny and things like that. They need to be able to learn how to fight through stuff like that. They need to learn how to get some discipline. Because you know what? After a few minutes of them crying and whining, I'm hot, I'm sweaty, there's flies on me, there's gnats on me, and I tell them to shut up and stop whining like a little girl, do you know what they end up doing? Just shutting up and just fighting through it. And then the next time they come out, maybe they'll whine a little bit for a few minutes and then they see I'm not going to put up with it. Shut your mouth. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'd say, be quiet. And be good. You're not going inside. You might as well just be quiet and just do what I'm telling you to do. And I always tell them. I try to uh, uh, help them to understand it. Give them understanding of actually what's going on. If you'd stop whining, you're just wasting time right now while we could be actually putting work and investing time into this task to get it finished and then we could be inside faster. So you're just all the whining because you're not going inside no matter what. So all the whining is just causing us to be out here longer with whatever work we're doing. So how about you just shut your mouth and work hard and then we can go inside sooner. You know what they end up doing? Shutting up and working. And then over time, you know, Jeremiah is still in the phase where he just cries and whines. You know, hopefully we're able to get him out of that. But uh, you know how he is. But Elijah is now to the point where <coughs> if he goes outside to do a task with me, he shuts his mouth the entire time. He, he hardly ever cries and complains and whines if he's by my side. Hardly ever, no matter what I'm doing. He'll just continue the whole time and he'll just work the whole time because he knows that he just has to. So what happens is over time you start, they start to d d develop this character and mold into this character where they know that, hey, I just have to do this. This is just something that I have to do. Well, that, that example is being used for an adult in this situation of going through hard times. He's comparing that unto his trials and tribulations and hard times that he's going through in his Christian life in the sense of Jerusalem being destroyed and all of the just catastrophes that have taken place in Jerusalem. And he's saying that this is good for me. It's good for me to be able to learn to wait and to hope for my reward later. Look at what it says, because notice the context speaks about looking forward to hope while you're in the midst of a trial. It says in verse number 29, He putteth his mouth in the dust, if so be, if so be there may be hope. Now that's talking about someone that is, <coughs> that's talking about someone that's bear, <laughs> bearing a yoke. <laughs> saying he's putting, how is your head when you have a yoke on you? Down, Right? So it's saying like he puts his, his, his mouth in the dust, like his head's down and he's just plowing away and his mouth is in the dust. Why? Because there's hope. Because there's a time, why? Because there's a time when you're going to be done. There's a time when you're going to be finished. Like there's a time when all the trials and tribulations that he's going through is going to be over and the Lord's going to come back and give him his reward. Keep watching and I'll show you that. Verse 30, he giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is 
filled full with reproach. Now we're going to take a small break. Just go back to Isaiah chapter number 50, <coughs> excuse me, because this is also a, a, a very interesting, just kind of random prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Isaiah chapter number 50, and this is speaking in context. Everyone is well aware of that, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 5. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was, <coughs> excuse me, was not rebellious, neither turned away my back. This is talking about Jesus being perfect and, and being sinless. I gave my back to the smiters, watch this, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the beer, beard, I'm sorry, the hair. Uh, uh, I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Now that is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll notice the statement that's in there is this, and my cheeks. So that's the, you got to take the full statement from verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks. So he's saying he gave his cheeks to them that plucked off the, the beard. Or the hair, I'm sorry, I did that again. Uh, it's talking about the, the hair on his cheeks. So he's talking about his beard. That's why I kept doing that. But it says, he's saying he gave his uh, uh, cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. So if you look at it and compare that to Lamentations chapter number 3, it's saying almost, it's very, very similar in verse 30, he giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. So notice that. And remember Jesus, they were smiting Jesus with the rod. They were plucking off the hair of his beard. This is talking about Israel being punished. Jesus took Israel's punishment. He is Israel in the sense that he is the seed of Abraham. Israel is the seed of Abraham. This is very prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ bearing our punishments. And if you remember, Jesus actually said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then he talks about how, he says, For I am meek and lowly of heart. And he, says that it, and he, and he talks about how his, how his yoke is light and his, and his burdens are easy. And notice right here it's talking about a yoke. So we see this connection here uh, of just kind of a, a, a hidden prophecy in there about the Lord Jesus Christ. Very similar statement. And it even says this, he is filled full with reproach. Notice it says he is filled full with reproach. Who? Jesus bore our reproaches. He bore our sins. So that's a prophecy there of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Lord will not cast off forever. If you think about Jesus, what was his situation? You know, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was as if he had, had cast him off or for, he had forsook him. So he's saying he will not cast off forever. Why? Because after three days and three nights, he rose again from the dead. Verse 32, but though he caused grief, this is talking about God, it's talking about uh, Jesus, uh, or I'm sorry, the Lord punishing. But though he caused grief, Yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Now if you tie that in with verse number 22, remember it says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. So even though we're going through this grief and these trials and, and, and punishments, you know, the Bible is teaching here that he still is going to have compassion on us later. Yet will he, even though we're going through this grief and he caused this grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. <clears throat> Verse 33, For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Now that's a very, very interesting verse. Because it says, For he doth not afflict willingly. That's saying that he doesn't want to afflict them. Like God does not desire or want to cause punishment to us. Uh, uh, turn to Ezekiel chapter 18, a very famous verse. <clears throat> it's the very next book in the right, about went the wrong way. To your right, Ezekiel chapter number 18, and it's verse number 23. <clears throat> it says, <clears throat> this is the Lord speaking, Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God? And not that he should return from his ways and live. So notice God is saying that that's not what I want is for the wicked to die. He's saying that what I would desire is that the wicked would turn from his evil ways. Now this is also found in Ezekiel 33, very similar statement. But he's saying I don't have pleasure in this. I don't take pleasure in, in just, just slaying people and killing people and, mur you know, it wouldn't be murder, but just, just taking people's lives. The Lord does not take pleasure in that. He does not like that. And, you know, the atheists will try to paint God as being like this mega, uh, uh, how's that word? Megalomaniac. Megalomaniac. You know, I messed myself up there for a minute. Megalomaniac. 
that still is not, I don't think, exactly right the way that I pronounced it, but uh, uh, just being sadistic, right? He's just like, like, he, like the Lord is like this, this, this sadistic, weirdo, crazy person. He's just like, sadistic's like where you're enjoying pe other people's suffering. But the Bible actually says that he does not take pleasure. Sadistic would be like a person that takes pleasure in other people suffering and dying. Well, God is actually the exact opposite. God does not take pleasure in people dying. God does not take pleasure in people suffering. God does not like when people are having to be uh, 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 grieved and afflicted. God doesn't like that. And that's why it says here in verse number 33, for he doth not afflict willingly. Say he doesn't want to. Willingly is like what he wants. He doesn't want to afflict people nor grieve the children of man. But of course he's a just God. He has to punish them. That's the point. Uh, and then it goes on like saying he doth not do, or do it willingly. It says in verse 34, to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth. Saying he doesn't want to do that either. Uh, verse 35, to turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High, to subvert a man in his cause. And then it says, the Lord approveth not. Saying he doesn't like these things. That's his point. He doesn't approve of these things in the sense that he doesn't want them to happen. You know, it's, not, it's God's will that they wouldn't happen. It's just like this. It's not God's will for people to go to hell. God does not desire and want people to go to hell and just burn for all eternity. Now, the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. He's not, you know, God wants everyone to be saved. God wants everyone to go to heaven when they die, but you know, people reject Him. People deny everything that He did for them. They reject the free gift of salvation that He offers freely. He couldn't do any more for them. And they just reject it. He has no choice at that point. He has to punish them. He's just... He has to punish them. His mercy goes as far as it can without violating his justice. Right. And then at this point, you know, they've made their own decision. And he will rightfully punish them because he's a just God and he'll send them to hell. It's the same thing. God doesn't want to punish you in your life for your sin. God doesn't desire it. God doesn't look for it. He's not like he's sitting up in heaven like, ha ha, when is he going to sin next? And then he's just waiting just to destroy your life. Just to, you know, take all your money and just cause horrible things to happen. God doesn't enjoy it. He's not, you know, this sadistic, crazy person like atheists will try to make him out to. God does not like for you to suffer. God loves you and wants you to be blessed and wants you to have a good life. That's what God would desire for you. But God, of course, will punish us when we deserve it. He is a, a, a merciful God. And His mercy will only go so far, uh, uh, with, thus without violating His righteous justice. And then it says in verse number 37, Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth it not? So it's saying, who can overturn what the Lord has commanded, what the Lord has said? No, no one, of course. Uh, verse number 38, Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. Now, evil there means like harm. Saying like God, when God commands something, this is being tied in with what we read before. Before, we, before I elaborate on that, remember how I was talking about great is thy faithfulness and how God actually proved his faithfulness by punishing the nation of Israel? He's showing that he's faithful. Notice that, that the man that's writing in the midst of acknowledging that he's being punished for his sins and that the nation of Israel is being punished for his sins, he is acknowledging God's faithfulness. Why? Because God said that he would punish them for their sins if they did this. And he says, great is thy faithfulness. Well, verse number 37, he says this, Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth it not? Saying that no one can overturn what the Lord said that he would do. God told them that if you violate my commandment, I'm going to punish you. That's why it says in verse 38, Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. Saying that God will punish you or cause harm. You know, that's the punishment. That's the evil, the harm. He will bring harm upon you, but it will also bring good upon you. Now, the proof of that, that it's talking about punishing them for their sins, look at verse 39. Wherefore doth a living man complain and a, a man for the punishment of his sins? So notice that no man can overturn the commandment of the Lord saying that God is going to be faithful and God will not not punish you when he says that he will. And also it ties in with, you know, evil coming out of the mouth of the Lord and also good coming out of the mouth of the Lord. What was the evil? If you remember, 
What did, uh, 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 what did Joshua say? He said, I set before you this day blessing. blessing and cursing, life and death. You know what that is? Good and evil. That's what that is. That's what this is talking about. Out of God's mouth proceeded what? Blessing and cursing. Life and death. Good and evil. And what he's saying is, who can overturn God's commandment? Doesn't proceed out of the mouth of the Lord good and evil, life and death, blessing and cursing. And then he relates that to, wherefore doth the living man complain a man for the punishment of his sins? Saying, you are being punished for your sins because we violate God's commandment and God's not going to overturn his faithfulness. Great is God's faithfulness and good and evil both proceed out of his mouth. And uh, I want to make a, a parallel here just to show you further how the book of Lamentations is very much poetry. There's almost a verbatim statement from the book of Job. Turn to the book of Job, which is, of course, a, a, a poetic book. It's a book of poetry. It's in the section uh, in your Bible uh, of poetry. In the Old Testament, they're broken into uh, different uh, uh, sections or categories. Uh, you can maybe even say genres, I guess. Look at Job chapter number 2, verse number 10. It says this, <clears throat> But he said unto her, Job speaking unto his wife, <coughs> Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we, not, shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. So notice a very similar statement. Like, shouldn't we receive good and evil from God? You know, God is going to give good and evil. Why? You know, because we sin. So God's going to bring evil upon us when we do bad things. God's going to punish us. Negative things, uh, 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 you know, provoke a negative response. They procure a, re a negative response from the Lord. Good things procure good, good response from the Lord. A good response. <clears throat> uh, so then it says in verse number, look at verse number 40. It says, let us search and try our ways and turn again. <coughs> to the Lord. This is like talking about examining yourself. You know, in 2 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter number 13, the Bible tells us to examine ourselves. It says examine yourselves, right? Uh, you know, it's like uh, the disciples when they're seated uh, at the, uh, the Passover, right? The Lord's Supper, that table. And they say, Lord, is it I? Kind of like they're examining yourself, themselves. We should be do, do examinations on ourselves. David does this very much so in prayer oftentimes. You know, he talks about try me, right? Uh, uh, try me, and, 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 he, and he says uh, to look at his heart, right? And see if there be, he says, any wicked way in me. We should do this. Uh, in our lives frequently. We should stop and do some, what this is called is introspect, right? Introspect is where you are examining yourself and seeing whether you have any kind of sin. Sin creeps up very suddenly in our lives and we won't notice it. So it's good to stop and examine ourselves and what you can do is before, if you do that often, what you can do is you can nip it in the bud. You can get rid of it while it's, you know, before it's got this, you know, this big large tree that's grown up. You can get rid of it while it's a small problem before it grows into a bigger problem. So we should often be examining ourselves. And notice how he words this in verse 40. Let us search and try our ways. And then he says, and turn again to the Lord. What, is the, uh, what does that denote when it says try our ways and turn again to the Lord? It denotes that you're probably going to have something that you need to turn to the Lord for. Obviously, in the context, it would be them doing that, but... If you apply it to yourself, all scripture is profitable for us. You're going to be able to find some kind of sin in your life. Whatever it may be, you're going to find a sin in your life, something maybe that's growing, something maybe that you struggle with your, your, the entirety of your life. Whatever it may be, you're going to be able to find something in your life that you need to stop, repent of, and, you know, that means turn from, ask for forgiveness, of course, not in that exact order. Ask for forgiveness and then repent from that particular sin. This has nothing to do with salvation. This is just their daily walk with God, just trying to walk in righteousness and please the Lord. In our Christian life, we should be constantly trying ourselves, examining ourselves, and turning again to the Lord in all different uh, uh, phases of our Christian life and areas of our life, trying to clean them up and fix them. Verse 42 says this, We have transgressed and have rebelled. Thou hast not pardoned. A pardon is like, a, like forgiveness is what a pardon would be. Saying that God did not forgive them this time. God punished them. Verse 43. Thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us. <coughs> Thou hast slain 
Thou hast not pitied. To pity someone is to show mercy or to feel bad for them. Sympathy. Saying God did not was not sympathetic when this happened. God was angry and persecuted them. <laughs> Last verse there, verse number 44, it says this, Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that our prayer should not pass through. And this has been mentioned a few different times. It's important not to get ourselves in, in a place in our lives where God will not answer our prayers. That's a scary, sad place to be. I know I've said that a few times, but let those words sink in. You could, it is possible that you, whoever you may be, whoever you are, if you're a Christian, that you could get to a place in your life where God would not want to answer your prayers anymore. This happened to Saul, who was the anointed of the Lord, who uh, God had chosen to be a great man. It was going to be greatly used by God. It was greatly used by God for a period of time. First king of Israel and wrought righteousness for him and did many great things as far as being the captain of the host and the king of God's people. But then he backslid and, you know, just, just became so estranged from the Lord where God would no longer answer him. And right here, the, what's being depicted is God covered himself with a cloud. God put a cloud in between himself and the people so that the prayers... It's such a large, thick cl cloud that the prayers of the people was not able to make it to the Lord. That's a scary place to be. Where God's made up his mind where he says, I don't even want to answer your prayers any longer. I don't even, it doesn't matter what you pray for. I mean, obviously in that case, if you realize that you've done wrong and you acknowledge it, God's not even going to listen to you in that case, in that type of situation. You just, sometimes you've just gone too far. You know, the Bible talks about where you, you, you procure so much you know, anger from the Lord to the point where there's no remedy. A remedy is like, it's where we get our word like medicine, right? It's saying you can't fix it. That's what that means. There's nothing that you can do to fix it. Sometimes you dig yourself a hole and it's too late. You know, you got to be buried in it. That's, that's all you have left. You know, uh, you just have to, you have to eat of the fruit of your own hand. Now, I looked at this last week with Proverbs chapter number one. I know it was mentioned last week. But it's a good point to, to end on again this week as well. Uh, because the whole reason why I picked the book of Lamentations is to help us understand the punishments for sin. It's good for this to be brought up a few different times. It's for us to look at and see the consequences of sin. And what happened there in Jerusalem was because of their great sin. It was because of the great wickedness, the horrible wickedness. And it was because of this perpetual pattern of sin, of just grievous sins. And there's a difference between having sin in your life, like we're all going to have, as I mentioned, a perpetual pattern of sin, as in we're all going to continue to sin in our lives. But there's a difference in sinning in your life daily while you're fighting it and you're, you're wrestling with your sins and you're wrestling with the flesh, right? Then, there, you know, the, the man that's just embracing his sin. Those are two way different things. You know, the, the Bible talks about sinning will, willfully, and then it also talks about, you know, a, a person that would sin in ignorance. Two different types of sin. You know, or the person, you know, that maybe is, is, is at least fighting his sin. He's trying to put up, you know, a fight with his sin every day. And it just kind of creeps up on him and deceives him. And he goes long periods of time without falling into this particular sin, whatever it may be. You know, and he's struggling with it and he's trying. Those are two way, way, way different things. So do not, don't put them in the same category, right? We're all going to continually sin, but you know what we need to make sure that we don't do? We don't need to get to a place where we embrace our sin. We don't need to get to a place where we justify our sin. We start justifying the reasons why we don't keep this commandment any longer, or the reason why we don't keep this commandment any longer, or the reasons why we don't do this. And oftentimes this is what people do, and they'll change their, their, their doctrines, they'll change what they believe to justify their sin. Or they'll change the things that they stood for in the past. When somebody starts liberalizing or apostatizing, they all the time they start changing all of these convenient doctrines that just suit them in the position they're in. Whatever predicament, whatever situation that they're in, if they're struggling with something, it's a lot harder to continually fight that struggle than it is to just give up and say, oh, I don't believe that's wrong anymore. You know, it'd be real easy for, it's real easy for the drunkard just to say that he doesn't think that getting drunk is a sin. That's what they would tell you. Yeah, I don't think, ah, oh, Jesus drank wine. That's the kind of foolishness that people would say. Why? Because they're trying to justify their sin. Because they wouldn't want to try to, you know, overcome that. 
or you know rehabilitate themselves and get you know uh, get that sin out of their life what people do is they justify their sin you will never you know let me say this <coughs> With very few exceptions, you're not going to find someone that is liberalizing and apostasizing that's going to say, I'm a liberal. Yeah, brother, I'm just in apostasy. They're not going to say that. They're just going to change their beliefs. They're just going to change what they believe. Of course, their actions are going to change. Of course, the things that they do are going to change. But then they're going to change their beliefs also to suit their lifestyle. And this is what people will do when they start liberalizing and apostasizing and moving away from the Bible. This is a fundamental Baptist church. We stand for the fundamentals of the faith. We are militant. We're not, you know, just, you know, hope church. We're not just cornerstone church. We're not just one of these, you know, one of these just, just, you know, uh, uh, I guess you could say Chuck E. Cheese churches, right? Perfect example, everybody's heard so many different times. But it's a good example. It's a, you know what it is? They're not serious. That's what that means. Right. That type of church is not a serious church. Right. Those types of churches that you go to, they are social clubs most of the time. Almost all of the time. Whatever you want to call it, Bible church. You know, whatever these types of churches are. What are some, uh, you know, Elevate. This is not Elevate Church. What are some of the churches around here? What are some of the... the 1122. That sounds like a nightclub. That's ridiculous. That's what they want it to sound like. That's, that's the purpose of that name. You know, that they want, you know what that screams? Social club. That's what they want that to sound like. This is a social club. That's not Valiant Baptist Church. Amen. Valiant Baptist Church, even in that name, that's a strong name. Valiant Baptist Church. Valiant means courageous. Valiant means you're fighting. We are going to fight and stand against liberalism until the, day, until, until the day that I die. At least that's as long as I can say that. And hopefully the next pastor says the exact same thing. Yeah. We're not liberalizing. We're not apostatizing. We're not dropping Baptist off our name. Baptist stands for the fundamentals. That's what Baptists do. That's why we're Baptists. Yeah. Baptists believe the Bible. That's why we're Baptists. Well, this is a fundamental Baptist church, and we are militant about our beliefs. We believe in the fundamentals of the faith, and we are fighting. That's what we're doing here. We're going to continue to fight. We're going to continue to fight against liberalism and apostatizing and all of these other doctrines that try to creep in. And it's the same battles that the last generation fought. It's the same types of issues. People are always in every generation fighting against, you know, people trying to you know, creep in and change doctrine and change all of these different types of things. And it's not always nefarious. Sometimes somebody is just becoming a liberal. They're not going to say, hey, I'm liberal. Hey, look at me, I'm a liberal now. I no longer believe the Bible in every area. Are they going to tell you that? No. They're going to try to justify their beliefs. But let me tell you this. You'll notice patterns in their lives where their lives change. Their Christianity changes. All of a sudden, they're not so serious. All of a sudden, church isn't that important. All of a sudden, doing the work of the Lord isn't all that important. I guarantee you they're not reading their Bible as often. I guarantee you they're not praying as often. I guarantee you if you're able to look into their heart, it's not, it's not near as important to them as it was in the, in the past. That's not happening here. And I'm going to do the best that I can do. Hey, I understand, you know, therefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. But with everything that is in me, I can at least say to you right now on, what is it, March the 25th? Is that the date? On March the 25th, 2020, I am going to do the best that I can that I never give up fighting. Amen. Ever. I'm going to keep fighting. We're going to be Baptist until I die. It's not going to become Valiant Church. Never. It's going to be Valiant Baptist Church. It's a fundamental Baptist church. We believe in the fundamentals of the faith. We believe in clean living. We believe in righteous living, walking a sanctified life, living a good, clean life. We're going to sing the hymns of the faith. Amen. That's what we're going to sing. We're not bringing in this trash music. We're not bringing in all this garbage music that's 1122. What kind of music do you think they play there? You think they sing holy, clean songs? Or do you think they sing the types of songs that it's just all it's meant to do is just sound like the world? They want, they want their name of their church to sound like the world. They want their music to sound like the world. They want their pastor to look like the world. They want the church itself to look like a nightclub. You know, they want to have their bars. They just exchange the alcohol for the coffee bar. 
Right? That is not a coffee bar in there, so nobody say that it is. But they make it look like it. They want it to feel like the world. They want the music to sound and feel like the world. They, they want it to be worldly. Not happening. I want people that are worldly to walk in here and say, this is different. This is, this, this, something's different here. We're not going to change for them. They're, we, they're going to come here and we're going to try to change them. Amen. We want to we make a fundamentalist out of the liberals. We don't want you know, fundamentalists to become liberals. I want the exact opposite to happen. I want to make you a fundamentalist. I want to make you take your... You know what that means? We take things serious. Amen. That's what that means. I actually believe this book. That's what that means. The fundamentals of the faith. I'm not backing down on things in this book. I'm fighting. It's militant. I take this book serious. And I'm going to continue to take it serious. And that's what we're going to continue to do here at Valiant Baptist Church. Amen. We're going to fight the fight. We're not backing down. Nothing has changed. This is an independent fundamental Baptist church. It's Valiant Baptist Church. And that's not changing. We're not liberalizing. We're not apostatizing. It's a good ending if we compare that to that. We look at this. <coughs> it's good to do introspect. Examine yourself. See where you're at in your faith. See where you're at and get back to where you were if you've backslidden. You know, a sinful life, an issue in your life, maybe pride, <coughs> laziness. You can have a root of bitterness that, that you know, pops up. <coughs> It springs up, and it'll defile you in other areas of your life. <clears throat> Look at your life. Get those sins out of your life. Get all those sins out of your life so that you don't fall into this trap of not taking your Christianity seriously, of liberalizing and apostatizing and changing all of your doctrine, laying the foundation over and over again. You know, <clears throat> you know learn your Bible, and when you lay your foundation, lay it once, and don't keep going back to it. I'm not going to keep questioning whether or not Jesus is God. I'm not going to keep questioning whether or not He rose again from the dead. I'm not going to keep questioning whether or not the King James Bible is the Word of God. You know, there, I'm going to lay down the fundamentals one time. I'm going to be a hundred million percent positive. I couldn't be any more positive that I'm right about this. And I'm not going to go back and dig up the foundation and lay a new foundation. Do some introspect on where you are in your life. Make sure your foundation's right. Prove it with this book. Be able to prove it to other people. Fight for it. Know that it's true. Stand up for it. And you know what? Look at yourself right now. You need to, you need to, uh, 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 you know, you know, take a moment and just prove yourself and make sure and say to yourself, I'm not changing. I'm going to make sure that I don't liberalize in my Christianity. Because you know what? A lot of other people, everybody who did liberalize that was a fundamental Baptist, they didn't think they were either. They didn't think they were going to be out of church. They don't think that they were going to be... There are so many people in my life I can attest to that I've seen this happen. So many! They didn't think they were going to be out of church. They didn't think that <coughs> they were going to stop. You know, they were going to move away from the King James Bible. So many different people. Lay your foundation once. Know that it's true. Know that it's right. Make a commitment. I'm not changing. I'm not liberalizing. And then fight Join in the battle with Valiant Baptist Church to fight against liberalism and apostasy and fight for the fundamentals of the faith. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, dear God. We thank you <clears throat> for uh, uh, the Bible being a book that, that contains principles and fundamentals that are clear and obvious. Help us to fight for them. Help us to stand for them. Help us to be courageous and valiant and warriors for the truth, dear God. We thank you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for the book of Lamentations. Help us to learn much from it. Learn character. Learn sufferings. Learn the consequences of sin. There's so much, dear Lord. Help us to be good parents and to, and to uh, teach our children to work hard and not allow them just to, to be whiny brats that just think that they can get whatever they want for not doing anything. Help us to uh, just do a good job. All of us, everyone in here, do a good job in every area of our life. Help us to, to actually care and be concerned about whether or not you are pleased with us. We love you so much and in Jesus Christ's name, amen.